work is also having an impact on the lives of women. If we think, for example, in South Sudan, thanks to IEEA's work in communities, women have been empowered to move out of poverty because they got help to op optimize small-scale farming by determining when and how much water and fertilizer should be applied through the use of nuclear and isotopic techniques. We need to keep giving visibility to these success, these success stories and the women who are part of them. Tomorrow, I'll share it, share it, share it. <laughs> um, and because we want to have as many of you here as possible, not even at our tables, but also involved in our IEA activities. The feminist uh, foreign policy, and the idea behind this is to uh, systematically integrate a gender perspective throughout our foreign policy agenda. And while much progress has been made over the course of the past decades, women remain unrepresented at the IEA and other international organizations, while at the same time, uh, we are falling victim to stereotypical norms which impedes progress towards greater gender equality. And as we can see when looking at the latest statistics from the IEA, despite the progress that has been made that we just heard about, women in the nuclear field and more generally in STEM related fields uh, continue to face particular obstacles come these challenges. But as you alluded to in your question, the promotion of greater representation of women can't be achieved solely through measures taken on the international level. While this is of course important, it's of equal importance that we simultaneously work on the domestic level with a view to enable an environment which will allow and also entice girls and young women to enter into the nuclear field. Sweden, my country, has come a long way in fostering an environment which encourages girls and young women to pursue careers in the STEM-related field. There is much to be said regarding the many factors which contribute to why women might or might not pursue a career in STEM, but today I would want to focus on the importance of having role models. Recent studies have highlighted the positive impact of female role models on girls and young women, with these beneficial effects best summarized by the concept of seeing is believing. Seeing people who look like you out there doing the things you want to do, or even doing the things you never thought about doing, makes a difference. And it showcases that it's possible for you too. And it provides assur assurances that you also belong in this field. Exposing girls and young women to visible role models that are working, teaching, and making discoveries in STEM can therefore play a vital role in breaking down those invisible barriers which otherwise might keep them from pursuing their dreams. So the seeing is believing concept of female role models also influences the way men and boys view women in STEM. It's sometimes hard for men to imagine women excelling in these fields, especially in leadership positions, if they don't see any examples. And this is part of what we call the perception problem, where the perception often is that science and research are principally a male pursuit. And an attitude like that can often be traced right back to the experiences in the classroom, where male science teachers have often been the norm. So having successful and visible women in STEM, and especially in the field of education, is crucial for overcoming these types of stereotypes regarding the respective roles of women and men also in the nuclear field. I spoke to a professor at the Royal Technological Institute in Stockholm uh, a while back, and she said that the lack of role models had prevented her for a long while to apply for a professor post, until someone, a man, actually encourage her to go for it. And she now takes it as a very serious part of her job to be that role model for other women in her institution. Moreover, not having female role models can easily turn into a vicious circle, where there are not enough women in prominent positions to inspire the next generation of girls and young women to pursue a career in STEM. And this perpetuates the negative spiral, and we must all work hard to disrupt this pattern, which to a certain extent continues to this day. And this brings me to your question, what is the new frontier for Sweden, the next frontier for Sweden? While we have come a long way, as you also highlighted in your question, we still face challenges when it comes to the private sector. Sweden currently ranks among the better countries in the EU, which is rather depressive, since 
when you learn that only 35% of board members of companies listed on the Swedish Stock Exchange are women. So promoting greater gender equality on the board of corporations is not only all that different from how we must work with international organizations. And I once again want to point towards the importance of role models, because with better representation, be it in STEM, in international organizations, or on the board of different corporations, it will encourage girls and young women to expand and achieve their career goals. So I think that role models is really the key message here from me today. And then if I should move on to your second question, mm -hmm. just briefly, yes. um, I've had the opportunity to serve as the perm rep of Sweden to many international organizations and institutions throughout my career, from the OECD and UNESCO in Paris, uh, to the OPCW and the international courts in The Hague, and now here uh, to the international organizations in Vienna. And it's always been my goal to bring gender issues to the forefront. I started working with gender issues in 1995, uh, just after the Beijing conference. So I've been along in this, in this field for, for a very long time. And promoting a culture of gender equality, diversity and inclusion, it's not just a matter of principle for me, it's also been proving to lead to better results for all the parties involved. So from a purely practical perspective, it would be in all our shared interest to redouble our efforts in, in this regard. And this, when I was at the OECD, I launched what we call the Friends of Gender Equality Group uh, at the board of the OECD. Uh, and this Friends of Gender Equality Group inviting one after the other all the heads of sections in the OECD Secretariat to meet with the ambassadors, to brief the member states what they were doing to mainstream gender into the policies and activities of their particular section. And initially, there was a little bit of hesitant, hesitance among the, the heads of the sections, but when they were encouraged by the whole board to really try to start thinking more about how to mainstream a gender perspective, they all were standing in line to come to the board and, and to speak to us. So that was a really very nice example and experience. And another example is when I was at the ICC, the International Criminal Court, and chaired the working group on gender justice uh, within uh, the member states. And this gender justice group aimed to integrate the gender perspective in all the work of the court through awareness raising, through training and advocacy. And of course, when you are at the court, and you are hearing cases that includes uh, the sexual and gender-based violence and many difficult questions, it's really, really important to have that gender perspective and the gender lens uh, mainstreamed and integrated. So my experience working on gender issues have taught me that gender equality goes way beyond counting just the number of women in the room. And while this could sometimes be a useful and easily, easily accessible tool to, to look at how is the women participation. It's clear to me that we must also pay due attention to less visible but equally important factors such as stereotypical gender norms and, and work culture. And in doing so, we are sometimes faced with uncomfortable questions that need to be asked, such as why are there almost often, uh, often almost only women in the audience at gender related events? And just take a look uh, uh, around you in this room we have an overwhelming majority of women and a few gender sensitive men to look to you. <laughs> and I think you know, when the work to promote gender equality is really a joint endeavor, one that we know benefits society as a whole, then we also need to include everyone in this endeavor. So asking and approaching fundamental questions like why you know, are we mostly women in here when this is the topic? Uh, these questions are vital for unco uncovering the biases and the prejudice that negatively affect women's opportunities and which hampers progress on gender equality. So asking and addressing these types of questions is something that I've done throughout my career and I will continue to do so in the future, I promise you. Thank you. Excellency, and indeed uh, to our tables, but we're working on it and highlighting that diversity is the work of everyone, and without everyone at
at the table, we will not achieve um, good policies and have and be effective and efficient to all the challenges that we are facing now and, and in the future. Um, now, I would like to um, address my comment and my question to the ambassador of uh, Morocco. Uh, Morocco Minister of Energy and Mines uh, and of Environment inaugurated Morocco's first national training center in nuclear science and technology as an extension of the national center. The new center aims to equip Morocco's nuclear scientists with the necessary skills to be qualified to safely and sustainably use of nuclear techniques. It is also seen to strengthen regional capacities in Africa in the field of nuclear science and related technologies within the framework of international and regional cooperation programs. My question to you, your excellencies, Excellency, is how has Morocco ensured that women are included in the nuclear sector and what national policies and good practices has Morocco developed and implemented to enhance gender equality in nuclear sector. The floor is yours. First of all, I would like uh, to thank you to thank the organizer for of this important side event to shed light on our collective action. I mean, men and women are at work for the presentation of women from all regions in the EPNC. As far as Morocco is concerned, I would like to highlight two points to answer to your question. First one, Morocco and gender parity. And the second, be the contribution of Morocco to the establishment of the chapter wing of Morocco. And the main activity of Morocco, Moroccan chairmanship of Win Africa. So just to share with you some statistics, at the national level, the Moroccan legislature reform led to a noticeable improvement in the representation of women, which moved during last decade, I mean 2010-2020, from 38.6% to 42%, and from 10 38% to 18, 52% at the level of senior position. So in 2022, a maximum wage was established in the agriculture, industrial, trade, and service sector, and 15 days paternity leave was granted to public sector employees. So the government aimed to achieve more than 30% activity rate for women by the year 20, 2026 and promote equitable access to decent work for women. So the Governmental Council has approved last June a decree establishing the National Commission for Gender Equality and the Empowerment of Women. Uh, <coughs> keep in mind that the Constitution, the new Constitution of Morocco of 2011, constitutionalized this Constitution, I mean this Council for equ Gender Equality and Empowerment of Women. Currently, we have seven ministers in our government, and one minister uh, is the Minister of the Energy Transition. Uh, for the first time, we, we have this woman at this, uh, this position. Four Moroccan wo women are working in the IEA, and we have also uh, the DDG, Najat Mokhtar, that you know, that she is also a woman from the first African and Arab women in, in IEA. For our regulatory body, just some information, AMSNUR reaffirms its commitment to gender equality. The representation of women in the agency has reached until now 46%. This rate reached 45% uh, at the level of position of responsibility. At the, at the level of nuclear, to answer to directly to your question, I mean, the nuclear scientific research, national institution and university, female represent currently more than 50%. While in Kinesten, the main national nuclear institution, 30% of the staff are female. Uh, at the university, female in nuclear are more than 20% of the professor in nuclear practice, nuclear medicine, radiotherapy, and medical physics. So at the WIN Global, Morocco chairs three out of seven expert group, Women in Nuclear Security Initiative, chaired by Professor Mkulkoum Hakam, Women in Nuclear Medicine Initiative, WIMI, chaired by Professor Ben Rice Minha, and Women in Nuclear in Emergency Preparedness and Response Initiative, chaired by Madame Khadija Bendam, engineer at the Kinestan. The, uh, the second point which I would like to highlight to answer to your question 
is uh, what is the contribution of Morocco in the establishment of the Charter of New Morocco and the main activity during uh, the chairmanship of Morocco mm -hmm. from Africa. I will start by, by briefing and underline three key points. Regarding WIN, it's worth mentioning that in 2019, Morocco has established its own chapter, uh, the third in the Africa region. Since its establishment, WIN Morocco organized and practice, participated in many national, regional, and international events. In parallel, during Morocco presidency from uh, 2019 until now, seven new national WIN chapters were officially established in seven countries in Africa including Tunisia, Ghana, Lesotho, Nigeria, Kenya, Niger, and Namibia. And new chapters are about to be launched in the near future. Well, under the Moroccan presidency, Win Africa set up three committees. That's for your information, strategic planning and program committee, communication committee, and finance committee. Many events were uh, organized during, I mean, from since our, our chairmanship, just for contribution of, of women in science and also in governance in the nuclear field. I will not uh, uh, quote all the events, but I would like to share with you some thoughts as diplomat of the matter. So as diplomat, I would like to share with you my thought in the time of a great uncertainty. We need science to guide us. We need women and men. Scientists to contribute to solutions to climate change global warming, food and energy, and water insecurity, emergence and preparedness. Young women and girls in developing countries, particularly in Africa, should be encouraged to enroll in science and give future perspectives, for example, jobs and family care. The IEA Marie Claire Cure Fellowship Program is a great example of opportunity given to women from developing countries. It is important that men, alongside with, with women are strong advocates. We need strong voice to fight for this. We need men who break the ceiling and men's breaking stereotypes. We need champions. We need role model that women can also identify with. You, you need to encourage women to be visible in science, mathematics, but also in managerial positions that don't have to be purely scientific. Also, we need to stop talking about women as their achievements as women are outstanding. They are outstanding as professional full stop. They is encouraged us to move past gender and hold up people for their capacity and capability. We are past the stage where women don't study science. There are more, more women enrolled in city in than men and in university. We need we when what we need uh, are equal equal opportunity and equal treatment. Women don't need special treatment. They need fair treatment. So, but, so nobody can say that they got where they, they are because they are women. They got because they are capable. I would like to end my thoughts by saying that Africa needs more attention. Africa needs the contribution of its own people, the contribution of every member of its, its society. In, in fact, our continent can, can't move ahead without strong, active, independent women at every level of responsibility and in every area of expertise. Thank you. Congratulations. As we know, um, an, essential co uh, an essential component for increasing the representation of women in the nuclear sector is ensuring that young girls stay in the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics classes. After more than three decades, the Philippines is again operating a nuclear facility. My question to you, uh, Ambassador Matilda, is can you please tell us more about programs which target girls' interest and participation in STEM field? Hmm. Thank you first to Wynne and to Mexico for this invitation to join you this afternoon um, to share with you what the Philippines is doing to get girls interested in the sciences and the technology, to sustain that interest throughout their school life, to support them as they pursue careers in STEM, and as they assume positions of uh, leadership in the chosen field. As uh, Janet has said, uh, the 
Philippines is proud to be among the top 20 globally and number two regionally to bridge the gender gap. A recent study has showed that we are on our way to, close the, to closing that gap as well in the STEM area. We have a number of women enrolled in STEM courses, catching up with the number of men enrollees. There is also an increase in the number of females in science and technology careers. 45% of 3.7 million Filipinos who have, who have SNT bachelor's degree are female. 54.3% of women working in the science and technology field have post-baccalaureate degrees. So how and what did the Philippines do to get there or to get to where we are now? In 1995, the General Appropriations Act, that's our national budget law, mandated the allocation of at least 5% of every national government agency's budget to gender and development. So every government agency in the Philippines has what we call a GAD program, Gender and Development Program. Agencies were required to design and implement programs and more importantly, a lot financial resources for program for girls and women's participation in various fields, including STEM. In 2008, the Philippines passed the Magna Carta Law for Women that seeks to eliminate discrimination against women and girls. Educational materials in schools, including images, were revised to remove gender stereotypes in education. Pictures of boys working with test tubes, beakers, in laboratories were replaced with photos or images of girls and boys. Inclusion of nuclear science and technology in school curricula was also implemented with the help of STEM agencies and institutions in the Philippines, and of course, with big help and assistance from the IAEA. Access to scholarships and training, especially in research and development for all women in all areas, including STEM, was also provided in that law. With these policy and resource allocations in place, government agencies such as our Department of, of Education, Department of Science and Technology, the National Academy for, of Science and Technology, the Philippine Space Agency, the national and regional science high schools conduct regular activities to stimulate interest among the young, especially girls, in STEM. GAD programs implemented in the country since the passage of laws have contributed to an environment where girls are encouraged to pursue STEM. And let me share some of these activities with you. The National Book Development Board of the Philippines published a Women of Science series for children. The book features stories of 10 of the Philippines' most respected female scientists written to spark curiosity and wonder in young minds and hopefully lead them to becoming women of science themselves. As the ambassador of Sweden has said, we need role models. We need role models for these kids, for these ch uh, young girls. Science and technology exhibits and fairs are mounted in high schools and colleges all over the country to showcase science and engineering projects of girls or teams with girls. Participation of girls in STEM competitions in and outside the country are also encouraged. Just recently, an all-women team from the Philippines beat 124 other teams from around the world to win the top prize in UNESCO's 2022 World Engineering Day Hackathon. Their project was on reducing water pollution. The other thing that we are encouraging both in the schools and in our homes. Now, young girls are encouraging and inspiring other girls to pursue STEM careers. A 16-year-old girl from the British School in Manila had uh, implemented during the pandemic a Girls for STEM website. 
Uh, she has a passion for numbers and she played mentor to 30 grade five and grade six girls interested in mathematics, coming from public schools outside of the cities and from financially disadvantaged families. Another one started, this is uh, after her, her uh, university degree, a nonprofit organization called WeTech, Women in Technology, that aims to educate and inspire the youth in breaking gender stereotypes and change the world through the power of technology. Another one started up Startup Pinoy. Pinoy is a colloquial for Philippine, Filipinas, Filipino women to provide support to females in the technology sector. We have other programs like the Women in Space Week, uh, Meet the Scientists Platform, a Future Leaders Forum. Uh, we also celebrate International Day of Women and Girls in Science. We hold the Women Engineers Summit uh, to promote SDG 9, Building Resilient Infrastructure, and a lot of other uh, projects happening in schools uh, to encourage children to pursue careers in, in, in STEM. Currently, we have a ratio of 29 men and 8 women national scientists. That's not a good number. So we hope that with all these programs and activities, we will achieve gender balance in terms of national scientists sooner or later. Thank you. And now I would like to uh, give the floor to Ambassador Holgate. Ambassador Holgate, you are a lifelong advocate for gender equality and you have worked actively to advance the inclusion of women. During your first ambassadorial posting to Austria in 2016 and 17, you promoted gender balance in the staff and programming of Vienna-based international organization and lay down a groundwork for the creation of the Vienna chapter of International Gender Champions. My question to you, Your Excellency, the United States, like many countries, is diverse in many ways in addition to gender. How is the United States working to ensure that their nuclear sector benefits from this diversity? The floor is yours. Thank you, Jeanette, and uh, thanks to everyone who's here this afternoon, and it's a great to be uh, among friends and colleagues on this panel, so I, I really appreciate the chance to join you all. Um, starting, in answer to your question, starting just with this week, uh, I'm proud to uh, note that six of the nine senior members of the U.S. delegation to this year's general conference, including the head of our delegation, are women. Uh, Secretary of Energy General Granholm, Jennifer Granholm, who, who led our uh, delegation, National Nuclear Security Administration uh, Administrator Jill Gruby, under um, let me see, um, Assistant Secretary of Nuclear Energy uh, Dr. Catherine Huff, and Deputy Administrator Corey Henderstein. And uh, earlier this week, we heard Under Secretary of State um, uh, for Arms Control and International Security Bonnie Jenkins talk about her inspiring story um, about as a woman of color in this field. And so I think we really uh, represented well <laughs> this week. Um, the U.S. strongly supports DG Grossi's commitment to increasing women's participation at all levels of the IAEA. And it's inspiring to see 50% of the DDGs uh, are women. And uh, it's so great to have Margie here um, representing that level of diversity. And of course, more work to be done. Um, in the uh, here, but uh, commitment to, to work on that by next year. And this is why we, uh, the United States, has provided financial support to both the IAEA um, Women in Nuclear Security Initiative, as well as the Maria Sklodowska Security Fellowship Program. And I can say that um, I, one of my uh, former interns uh, uh, earned one of those fellowships and had a, the Maria Sklodowska Security Fellowship, and I really had a a great report from her about how much it inspired her and the launch that it gave her in her career in the STEM area. The, uh, looking at the parts of the U.S. government that work on nuclear issues, the National Nuclear Security Administration is one of those uh, key elements within the Energy Department, and there are three of the four senior members of that department are women, some of whom I just mentioned. 
Uh, this is obviously not typical in the highly t uh, technical and traditionally male-dominated field, but it uh, could become commonplace if we continue to promote women in STEM and recruit and retain diverse workforces. A uh, word about how NNSA is, re is doing that recruitment. Um, through their offering fellowships to students at minority serving institutions throughout the, through the NNSA Minority Serving Institution Partnership Program. Uh, so reaching out to historically um, um, black colleges in uh, the United States and also an internship program. Um, they've also fund fellowships in national security, nonproliferation and STEM disciplines and each of the national laboratories and plants and sites associated with the Department of Energy have similar outreach programs that seek talented individuals uh, from diverse backgrounds. Uh, looking um, at ma making strides in building diversity in both public and private sector leadership, I, I will also note that the U.S. industry uh, delegation was led by uh, a, a woman from the White House and also by uh, a woman from the Nuclear Energy Institute, our trade industry, Maria Korsnick, who's the president and chief executive officer there, and she draws on her strong um, on, on her strong engineering background and her hands-on experience in nuclear reactor operations, deep knowledge of nuclear energy policy and regulatory issues to increase understanding of the economic and environmental benefits of nuclear energy among policymakers and the public. Now, the Nuclear Energy Institute has partnered with U.S. Women in Nuclear to develop a program called NECT, the Nuclear Executives of Tomorrow. Uh, and I was invited to speak with, uh, to this group a, a couple of years ago, and it was so inspiring. Um, it was created in conjunction with the Nuclear Energy Institute and nuclear executives across the United States in our utilities and our technology fields. And they felt that there was a need for executive level leadership development based on preparing the best and brightest individuals for future positions of great, greater strategic leadership within their respective organizations. And so they, uh, they identified highly capable female leaders primed for executive level development and um, cre created challenging experiential opportunities and also a, a tight-knit professional network focusing on helping each other succeed. Um, they, this, this then moved into a, an, uh, an even deeper effort called the Next Executive Immersive Leadership Program. And this is a 12-month long program uh, developed by a planning and oversight team of industry leaders to lend their knowledge and hands-on support in really prim in priming the pump here. And, and NEXT has graduated two cohorts, each with 12 to 14 members, and a third just began last summer, so that 58% uh, of each graduated class had received promotions during the program or within 12 months of completing it. So that shows that the investment is really capable of, of moving women forward in their careers. At the State Department, where, where I'm attached, uh, we are honored to have Ambassador Gina Abercrombie Wynn Stanley, the very first uh, dedicated Chief Diversity and, and Inclusion Officer. Uh, she is a longtime respected ambassador, uh, and uh, this office, they established a, an office of 12 to support her work. Uh, some of the steps that have been taken within the, the State Department uh, relates to elevating the DEIA principles in our performance evaluations and the promotion process by adjusting the mechanics and, and the processes of these to remove, in, um, to remove bias and um, have more accountability. The, there's an establishment of a data working group for DEIA, recognizing if you can't count it, you don't know if you've done it. And so the data group um, has established a demographic baseline report for the department, the first ever oldest department in the U.S. government, and it's the first time we've actually had data on DEIA issues that allow us to judge how well we're doing and where there are, uh, er specify where the areas are that need help. Um, this is all built into a five-year uh, strategic plan for the uh, DEIA, including using data to identify barriers to equitable career outcomes for department staff, implementing a comprehensive recruitment plan that tar targets underrepresented groups, and enhancing and adapting reasonable accommodations for persons with disabilities. Um, and so I, I'll, just, I'll just say, you know, when we're talking about nuclear issues, whether it's nuclear security, climate change, development, all the ways we talk and we have, you know, we talk in these very glorious terms, but each one of you has described an effort that each of your governments has done. 
And it is so exciting to see. Um, it's, it's real, it's actionable, and it works. So thanks for doing those things, and thanks for telling us about them. <laughs> and it's focused on uh, all regions. I also would like to highlight that the IEA has provided uh, a lot of support uh, uh, to create the WIN chapters uh, in Africa and in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, and they are, of course, a key uh, components of our network. And in this regard, I would also like to share with you a very concrete action uh, we have just launched this uh, week. This is a guide uh, that we uh, developed uh, in collaboration with ARCAL Agreement in Latin America and the Caribbean, and uh, also WIN Latin America and the Caribbean chapter, and with the great support of the IAEA, this is uh, the publication which is in, in Spanish and also in English available. And this is a guideline for gender mainstreaming uh, in the nuclear sector in Latin America and the Caribbean, with a very innovative approach because uh, on the one hand, we were able to uh, collect data, uh, which is key, and we also um, uh, had the opportunity to uh, hear to the voices of the women in the region. Uh, they were not considered in this study uh, as objects of study or categories. Uh, they were part of the process. And secondly, I wanted to highlight that uh, it was this very innovative because we developed recommendations for the national nuclear institutions uh, so that they can um, really work on more future equitable and um, inclusive workplaces. Uh, and uh, the idea is that we uh, can uh, make the best, the most, sorry, uh, in order to, um, to collaborate with the chapters and implement these recommendations. And my last uh, comment is that, of course, we cannot replicate this guide uh, in all regions exactly the same, but this is a first reference document that, of course, can be adapted to each region. So thank you very much. of this uh, event, not to just hear um, all nice words, but to hear concrete scenarios and initiatives that have been implemented. Um, let us all remember that our diversity is our strength, and it will lead us to a better and more innovative policies outcomes. Let us all address gender equality, diversity, and inclusion in our professional and professional pro personal life. Thank you very much, and then I would like to give uh, the floor cl for closing remarks to His Excellency Campusano. Uh -huh. Thank you very much, uh, Janet, and also thank you very much to all my colleagues. I think that they have shown really, as was pointed out by Laura, very, very specific uh, actions. And I only want to recall one aspect uh, of my life, and I think that this uh, can be presented by many, many other uh, people in many other countries. It's a par paradox. I remember that the, my female colleagues in the secondary school, and the, they were always excelling in STEM. They were absolutely the best, always. And the, I think that it's extremely pertinent what the ambassador to Sweden said, that seeing is believing. So we have really to stress that there are possibilities uh, of having a successful career in STEM for, for women. Therefore, I also uh, appreciate extremely uh, well, the, the different uh, examples that were given, but in particular, uh, I think that's important to highlight and share these best practices as the GAT programs in the Philippines uh, to foster opportunities for strengthening the empowerment of women. It's also of extreme importance to reach worldwide the point where all people are in the position where they are because of the capabilities and capacities, not uh, as because of their gender, as was pointed out by Ambassador uh, of Morocco. And the, 
it's, it's also uh, in times of uh, difficulties and uncertainties, uh, it's even more important the participation of women, particularly in peace processes. And uh, I, I would like to suggest also the possibility of considering that at national level, uh, uh, and also in collaboration with the, the chapters of women in nuclear in each country, there could be such kind of initiatives as Maria Slodowska Korea Fellowship, because it could be replicated at the national level, and this would be something very, 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 very positive. Well, uh, only to, to finish this uh, intervention, I appreciate uh, all of you for coming uh, here today. To uh, It was key, this exchange, to raise awareness and uh, identifying uh, actions that uh, can help us achieve gender equality in the nuclear field and even uh, in more areas. Uh, also, once again, the uh, usual call for other countries to join the Women in Nuclear, a group of friends, and the, to have from all regions uh, the participation. And of course, but not least, we would like to thank once again Janet, DDG uh, Frame, and Ambassadors, and the IA Secretary and Women in Nuclear for this very successful uh, event. Thank you very much. I think that you, you would agree with me that this panel, uh, very powerful women and then very powerful allies of, of uh, gender equality. So today this is very inspirational. Jeanette, well, very well done, uh, women in nuclear, and we all are very appreciative. So thank you. Very much.